Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. This build is the result of two things aligning. The first being the fact that the Mandalorian series premiered and exists and it's awesome and it's made me really love Star Wars again and me getting a 3D resin printer. I was looking for something interesting to be my first use of the printer and my buddy Uncle Brent over at Goobertown Hobbies had shared with me a photo of something he was working on for his Baby Yoda video and it was this really cool Mandalorian model and I knew that was it. I had to print that and find something to do with it. And I decided to make a little diorama, something that has absolutely nothing to do with gaming like most of my builds usually do. And I gotta say, it was really liberating and exciting to build something that was just for fun and for display and not for gaming. I didn't have to worry about modularity and durability and reusability and all the illities that usually alter the choices made when building gaming terrain. It was awesome. This is not any particular scene from the show. Nerd rage is something that just might happen if this is not correct to the lore. I don't, I don't really care. I just wanted to build something that had all the visually stimulating things that I love about the series and kind of mashed them together. I took some inspiration from Mos Eisley as well as the nameless planet where Mando gets hired to collect the bounty on the child. I don't know what that planet is named yet. Maybe people know in the future or now when watching this video. I don't know. I built this and filmed this episode around the time episode five of The Mandalorian was up. So. Who knows what happens later. Hopefully the series doesn't end up stinking. That would be a shame. One thing I did try to get right though was the way his armor looks at the time when he collects the child and has Baby Yoda floating around in this little floaty crib thing. So that's why he doesn't have all the fancy shiny armor and he also doesn't have the pauldron that's painted. It's that one particular moment which is actually my favorite look of him from the series, so. This build is gonna jump around a little bit because there was a lot of different things that I was doing in tandem to make it all come together in the end, so bear with me here, and let's take a look at how I built this Mandalorian diorama. First, I 3D printed a bunch of stuff, namely the Mando and Baby Yoda model. This is actually a mashup of two different sculpts someone combined, and I got the file on Thingiverse. I printed it out larger than 28 millimeter scale, and the whole model stands about two inches tall. This is a really nice size for a diorama. I'm not gonna get into the painting of this thing because that's a video in its own right, and I'm not the best mini painter. Let's be honest, you're here for the terrain building. After Mando, the first thing I knew I needed were some tiny storm Stormtrooper helmets to impale. This was really important to me because so far the image of impaled trooper helmets has been the most iconic scene in the show for me, even more than little baby Yodes himself. There was an STL I found that had a few helmets on spikes, but I wanted to have more control. So I actually found a full size wearable helmet model and sized it way down to match the scale of my mini. I printed a bunch out and cleaned them up. The fact it was designed as a wearable print meant that they were hollow and incredibly fragile at this size, especially before curing. But the cool thing is that this made them easy to drill through for spikes, easy to damage, and in general, they just looked more believable this way. Once the supports were removed and they were fully cured, I used some toothpicks to impale them. At this point, I was already getting crazy excited about this project and really loving the potential this new printer was unlocking for me. After painting the helmets, I realized the toothpicks looked a bit too bulky and smooth, so I carved them up with an X-Acto to make them look more realistic before painting the wood. I also printed a bunch of random bits that I thought might be useful later, just general sci-fi greeble type stuff, and I printed more than I thought I'd use just in case. 
The one specifically Star Wars bit I printed was one of these moisture farm things, but I printed it a lot smaller than it should be to better fit the size of the diorama that I was envisioning. Even though in the scale of the Mando Mini, this piece should be at least twice the size. I put all the bits on some large tongue depressors so I could more easily handle painting them. I just use hot glue as this is fast and easy to remove later. I hit them with some spray primer and left them to dry while I moved on to starting the actual build. I grabbed a sheet of quarter inch MDF to act as my base and using my mini, I roughly laid out what I wanted to build. I didn't plan this too much. I wanted to leave it pretty open as I worked, but giving myself this early constraint of overall footprint was a great way to start forming ideas. The next step was cutting a large piece of XPS insulation foam for the back wall. I made it fairly thick. This way it would have a good surface area to attach to the base, but also because I could then split the wall into a few layers to give my doorway some depth. I figured out where I wanted the door to be. This left one side fairly open for something else. One of the most defining features of Tatooine for me are the round stucco structures. I envisioned a large one on the side, but realized I didn't have any styrofoam balls large enough to do this or even raw material thick enough to make my own. So I opted for two smaller ones. With the door, I simply cut out a section of the middle layer of foam so I could embed the resin print. This was held in place with some tacky glue. For the outermost layer, I copied the arch of the door, but made it a half inch wider all the way around. After this, I created the stucco texture using a ball of aluminum foil. I wanted the door arch to have some stone pattern that you often see on these types of structures. At first, I drew them in with a pencil, but honestly, I didn't really like the way they were looking. I really wanted them to be slightly projecting from the main structure. I decided to pivot and use strips of construction paper to make false bricks. This actually worked really well. The biggest issue was that I had already drawn on the pattern with the pencil, so I had to make sure I covered all of those lines or it would look pretty weird. This meant I was a bit restricted in my pattern, but it worked out okay regardless. When I did the foil texture on the foam, I made one gouge that I did not like the looks of, so I decided to cut it out in a creative way by adding a circular window of sorts. I could have printed some sort of insert for this, but the thing is, I'm a crafter at heart, so rather than take the time to find and print something, I just grabbed a zip tie to add some interesting texture to the frame and a piece of construction paper to make the back. I wasn't quite sure what this area would look like once finished, but I knew I could probably add some greebles or something to make it look cool later. With those elements in place, I could attach the three layers of foam back together. To do this, I used Gorilla Construction Adhesive as in my foam glue test video, I found this to have the best results. The amount of glue would also add a nice bit of weight to the foam. Now I could start thinking about the ground coverage. I wanted something that would add weight, be durable and dry fairly quickly, and most importantly, be easy to create a non-flat surface without much thickness. Sculptamold is a no-brainer in this scenario. I absolutely love this stuff. It's got all the workability of joint compound, but it dries hard like a rock and the paper inside it means it's not brittle. Essentially, you can just slap the stuff on, get it somewhat spread out, then walk away for a bit. You gotta keep an eye on it to find that perfect moment when it's mostly dried, but not fully cured. And at this point, you can easily smooth it out and shape it using some water. To fill some of the gaps and cover the expanded styrofoam texture of the balls, I did switch to regular joint compound. And you might notice here that mine is pink. You can ignore that. Some companies sell patching putty that goes on pink and dries white. This is a silly gimmick marketed to people with no home repair skills. It doesn't serve much actual purpose. Just buy whichever one is on sale for the cheapest. I will admit though that if you're building terrain and have a few things on the go, this visual indicator for when it's dry is kind of handy. I use the same stuff to cover all the seams on the foam and seal the MDF edges. While that joint compound was drying, I realized the middle layer of foam by the door had no texture on it. Rather than awkwardly try to texture it with foil, 
I instead use some Vallejo texture paste to give it that stucco look. This creates a very different effect from the foil, which I actually think is a good thing as it adds a bit of variation to the textures of the structure. I also lightly coated the construction paper pieces, but I really watered this down and blended it out onto the foam. Overall, this thing was looking a bit plain structurally, so I wanted to add some bump outs on the building. I always liked how the Tatooine buildings had those angled buttress details, so I made a block of foam in that shape. Another great visual feature of a lot of Star Wars sets are the horizontal lines that decorate many surfaces. Using the hot wire, I cut in these lines, and doing it on the block first meant I could then split the block into multiple pieces and have lines that perfectly matched. Afterwards, I did think that the lines from the hot wire were a bit too thin and simple, so I carefully beveled each one using an X-Acto. By this time, all my joint compound was dry and I could sand all the edges nice and smooth. This is the point of a project where I typically coat the piece in Mod Podge that I've mixed with black paint. This seals and hardens the foam and the black paint acts as a base color. But in this situation, I'd be painting the structure beige, so black wasn't the best choice. I would have mixed up a small batch of Mod Podge and beige or brown paint, but I didn't have any unmixed matte Mod Podge and I had to improvise. I switched to basic PVA glue, but I did water it down and added some airbrush flow aid to help it perform a little bit more like Mod Podge. This does serve the same purpose of hardening as the Mod Podge, but it really does miss one important element in terms of sealing. The PVA is very water soluble, even when dry, whereas Mod Podge contains a bit of resin. This meant that when painting later, I did run into some issues where paint rehydrated the glue and made small bits peel off of the joint compound. This simply doesn't happen when using Mod Podge and is why I normally use it but your mileage may vary and PVA can be used in a pinch. I switched back to some Griebel prep. I thought it would be neat to tie the foam balls into the window thing with a bunch of pipes. Pipes are such an easy way to dress up a sci-fi sort of build. And yeah, this is a perfect thing to utilize a resin printer for, but also it's the perfect thing to craft. Bendy straws, well, they make great looking pipes. I cut a whole bunch of different lengths so that I'd have lots to work with later. These needed to be spray primed and painted, and they're a pretty awkward shape and size to do that with. So I came up with what I thought was a pretty clever solution. I used some cotton swabs as holders. They fit inside the straws perfectly, and I cut off one end into a point so I could impale them into a foam block to hold them while painting and drying. Now, back to the piece. The glue and paint sealing coat I put on didn't have decent enough coverage and was a bit translucent. So using a light beige, I gave the whole thing a nice, solid, and even coat of paint. I wanted a lot of the metal to have a deep brown, rusty look, so I airbrushed the pipes, door, and circle thingy a really flat, reddish brown. Doing the door and circle at this point meant I could touch up the overspray before moving on. Now for some washes. I first hit the pipes with a sepia wash, then did the same thing on the larger piece, but at that point I watered down the wash a lot first, I didn't want it to be too dark. And before it totally dried, I dabbed off a lot of the excess with a little bit of toilet paper. This would speed up drying and give it a little bit more of a stucco looking pattern. Sort of like a Venetian plaster. I could then come back with lighter shades of tan and off white and dry brush all the highlights of the stucco, giving the simple piece considerably more dimension and depth. Then the fun could really begin. I placed a bunch of the pipes I had pre-made into one area. In order to embed them, I used a drill bit that I just twisted by hand to make small holes in the foam. Then I could glue the pipes into place with PVA. To bond them to the flat paper area in the circle though, super glue was far more appropriate. Any ugliness in the holes surrounding the pipes were corrected with a little more joint compound. Now for the sand. Sand is kind of tricky to model. A lot of people default to using actual sand, but the thing is, at this scale, that looks more like gravel than sand. A really fine powder is better. In this case, I used unsanded tile grout in an appropriate color. 
This is the same stuff I sometimes use for plaster on buildings. I first soaked the ground with really watered down glue. And I have this spray Mod Podge that is perfect, but the spray bottle wasn't working too good, so I just brushed it on. I'm sure you could just dilute normal Mod Podge or PVA glue for this, and it would work exactly the same. To actually apply the grout, I used a sifter that I bought from the dollar store. This was my first time doing this application method, and I was really impressed with how well it worked. Much love to my buddy Luke from Luke's APS for turning me on to this. Check out his channel if you don't know it already. Seriously, go check it out. To really lock in the grout, I sprayed some more water on top. This will essentially turn it to concrete once it dries. This stuff will not fall off easily in the future. Remember, tile grout is meant to hold up on things like showers and floors. Before moving any further, I wanted to test out the technique I planned on using to finish the piece. Airbrushing on some very thinned sepia wash to blend areas together and create shadows. I knew I'd need to add more grout near the end after the bits to hide seams and stuff, and I wanted to ensure I had a way to blend things together. I also figured it would help the visual depth of the piece to not all be the same shade of beige. Feeling confident in the technique, I got to work doing what I had been looking forward to the whole time, adding all the fun stuff I printed and pre-painted, as well as the sweet, Sweet Mandalorian and Baby Yoda Mini. In many ways, this is my favorite thing I've ever built. Having this printer really unlocked a lot of ideas and creativity in me, and it sort of gave me permission to just do something for fun that served no gaming purpose. In the past, I've avoided projects like this because they're just so much work, and it's hard to justify that for tabletop RPGs where the pieces might only get used once or twice. But having the printer let me multitask and build this more efficiently, and I didn't have to justify as much time. And now I have this thing that won't get used in games, and I'm happy about that. It's gonna sit on my shelf as display, and I really love that idea. I'm proud of this build, and I wanna do more, insert air quotes, pointless dioramas in the future. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, hit that like button and let me know in the comment section below. That sort of interaction really helps these videos gain traction on this enormous, overwhelming platform behemoth that is YouTube. If you're thinking about getting into this hobby of miniature making, diorama building, terrain, tabletop gaming, and you need some guidance as to where to start, if you're overwhelmed and confused by all the supplies and tools and stuff that I use, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I've put a lot of time and effort into making my essential equipment page where I explain and list most of the stuff that I use regularly for my hobby. It's a really good resource and I encourage you to check it out. 
And if you really like these videos that I make and you want to help me keep making them every week, the best way you can do that is by supporting the channel on Patreon. It's the support there that allows me to justify all the extra time to film and edit these videos on top of doing my builds. And it's the best way that you can help me help you help the community and a whole lot of helping because helping is a really good thing. I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. Go check it out, all that good stuff. That's it for this week, guys. Again, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. Cheers, see you again next week.